Welcome to the webinar on uh, rhythm management in patients with tricuspid regurgitation. Uh, this webinar is uh, organized uh, in collaboration between the PCR tricuspid focus group and the European Heart Rhythm Association. Uh, I am uh, here in the studio together with, uh, 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 with uh, uh, Leclerc and with Marie-Jean. And uh, we have uh, uh, online connected uh, Nina Wunderlich, Martin Andreas, and Tom De Potter. And uh, uh, in this uh, webinar, the learning objectives are to get familiar with the diagnosis and consequences of tricuspid valve dysfunction following right ventricular lead implantation. We will uh, try to understand how to prevent and manage th these patients with uh, CID-induced tricuspid regurg. And uh, we will learn about surgical and interventional options in those patients. I would like to uh, mention that uh, the field of uh, uh, tricuspid regurgitation is merging uh, many arguments between the interventional community and the electrophysiology community. There are many arguments that we are now aware of, uh, including atherogenic tricuspid regurgitation, the, uh, the effects of lead extraction on, uh, uh, on uh, tricuspid uh, function. But today we will focus on this topic of CID-induced TR. Uh, I also would like to remind you that you can interact with us uh, using the uh, chat uh, with Slido. And without uh, further delay, I'd like to introduce uh, Martin Andreas from Vienna, who will present us a case so that we can discuss over a, a, a real case scenario. Thank you, Francesco, for your invitation, and thank you um, for having me. We start with a case uh, from Vienna um, uh, for lead management. Uh, these are my disclosures. So, uh, tricuspid regurgitation uh, is associated with a high mortality. Um, we know that we have to uh, decide between primary and secondary TR, and it's uh, uh, it is, in several cases, pacemaker induced. Up to 25% of uh, pacemaker patients do have a TR. So uh, um, there are emerging numbers of percutaneous tricuspid valve interventions uh, also in patients with a pacemaker. Our patient we discussed today um, is a 81-year-old um, woman. Um, she was uh, hospitalized for heart failure. Uh, also, signs of uh, right heart failure with ascites and edema. Um, she also had uh, um, alcos uh, due to um, a venous uh, outflow, um, probably venous um, problems. She was in her class 3, and she also had a mildly reduced right ventricular function. She had a previous pacemaker implantation um, with uh, one lead in the right ventricle and one lead in the right atrium, a non-significant three-vessel disease, and was suffering from COPD called 2. Her Euroscore 2 was 4.05, and her tri-score, uh, which uh, should be calculated for surgical intervention on the tricuspid valve, was uh, 14. This is a... Um, transesophageal echo view, and we see that uh, um, the right ventricular function is mildly reduced, and uh, you also see the lead in this image, and you may also see that it's not moving super freely. This is a 3D reconstruction of the echo, and there is also maybe the impression that the lead can be um, connected to the leaflet, there also we have a color view. Uh, maybe we can run the video here. Um, yeah, thank you. With a severe tricuspid regurg and the lead uh, is in the zone of the regurg, so it's a hint that it may be associated. Thank you, Martin. Okay, this I think, was uh, the case. Yeah, I think that is a, a good start. So we have a patient with uh, uh, a lead and a severe TR. 
and we understand that the imaging is fundamental in these cases. So I'd like to ask Nina to uh, uh, elaborate a little bit on uh, what is, uh, how should we uh, assess these patients? Nina Wunderlich. I mean, uh, Martin already pointed out that uh, this was a patient with severe tricuspid regurgitation. So what I would like to try in the next couple of slides to look more at the anatomical features we have to address if you look at a patient with pacemaker leads and uh, get some ideas how to approach such a patient if a patient appears in our, our practice or in our hospital. So we should always keep in mind that up to 25% of, of patients have an increase in tricuspid regurgitation severity after a pacemaker implantation. And we know nowadays that any degree of tricuspid regurgitation has an impact on the prognosis of the patient. What we also know is that a significant pacemaker-induced tricuspid regurgitation is associated with worse long-term prognosis for the patient. So it's worthwhile uh, looking at the tricuspid regurgitations, which are associated with um, uh, pacemaker leads. So the first thing we should address is how many leads are present. So is a lead placed apically or non-apically? And this plays a role because if you have a lead in an apical localization, um, these patients will have more frequently severe tricuspid regurgitation compared to the patient where the lead is non, not placed in a right ventricular apical uh, localization. So, for example, if you have a lead in septal position, this is associated with less frequent severe tricuspid regurgitation. The next thing I would uh, uh, look at is if the right ventricular lead is implanted very tightly, because if you do an intervention and you move the lead, uh, this might be easier lead to a dislocation uh, when you uh, manipulate um, this lead. The next question I would, I would address is if um, any lead in the right atrium is expected to interact with the device delivery system through um, its course. So as we can see here in this case, in, in this patient, the specific one, uh, we have an apical lead, but the right atrial lead is looking more in the direction of the right atrial appendage, and it's pretty far away from the tricuspid um, uh, uh, level, so I don't think that we have to fear any interactions here with the right atrial lead. And the thing I also would uh, always address is if the patient is pacemaker dependent, because to my experience, it's not that difficult during uh, an intervention to dislocate um, a lead and you should have a plan B. The next question we could look at is uh, where does the right ventricular lead pass through the tricuspid valve? Because we know that the severe tricuspid regurgitation occurs more frequently or less frequently if the lead passes through the middle of the tricuspid valve, but the uh, association with severe tricuspid regurgitation is much more frequent if we have a lead which passes between the commissures and to the right ventricle. The next question we have to answer is if the right ventricular lead causes uh, the tricuspid regurgitation. So in the example we have here, we can also appreciate here in the four chamber view that there is, uh, um, uh, that the lead is not really mobile as um, um, Martin Andreas already pointed out. But what's maybe more important is to look at the direction of the jet and what we can see here, it's not a straight jet, it's a jet which is um, deteriorated and is leading towards the septum. And this might indicate that we have a tethering here of the septal leaflet. And if you have an eccentric jet, it's always important to find out why the jet is eccentric. So we have a right ventricular inflow outflow tract here on the left hand side and again you can appreciate how eccentric the jet is and if you look at the image here on the right side which is a little bit more focused on the valve you can see that uh, um, that the lead is moving in unison here um, with a septal leaflet. So this might be the first hand that this uh, um, lead is attached to the septal leaflet. So if you look at the transgastric view again, so if you look at here um, um, at the pacemaker lead, it uh, still moves in unison with the septal leaflet. And uh, one of the major imaging modalities which really helps to define if there is an issue with the lead and if it's connected to the septal leaflet is x imaging or multiplanar reconstruction. So on the left-hand side, we here see an x image and you can nicely see that the leaflet is moving here um, with the lead, so it seems to be connected. And uh, with color Doppler um, uh, in, we can see that the jet is originating close or next uh, to the pacemaker lead. So um, 
In the next steps, we see here 3D office views with and with color, and this gives you uh, uh, another clue that the origination of the tricuspital rotation is really located very close um, to the pacemaker lead. So, um, if you think about the next step, if patient with a pacemaker lead um, is a suitable candidate or is a candidate for uh, an intervention, we should exclude first that we have any leaflet perforation or laceration, and we should also recheck the mobility of the lead. This can also be something done uh, during the procedure. Um, the next thing you should check is if there are any additional factors that may complicate the procedure. For example, the number of leaflets. So in this case, as you can see on the right-hand side, we have a tri-leaflet valve, which is uh, not that complicated if you would compare it with a four-leaflet valve. We also look at the jet origination, and this is in the middle valve, which is still favorable. And we also have to look at the size of the gap. And if you look at the gap, which is uh, broadest, maybe here close to the, um, to the septal leaflet where the pacemaker lead is implanted, it, but it's not a big gap. The next thing you should address if we have leaflet tethering, you should look at the leaflet quality and especially the radial leaflet length in the grasping area. So if I would look at this patient and um, if I would have to make a strategy, I think we would need maybe a device here in the interoceptal part of commissure and maybe another one in the posterior septal. So you should make sure that especially the radial length of the septal leaflet is sufficient uh, for grasping. And the last thing you should check um, is if the imaging quality is um, um, okay, if you can conduct um, a procedure with this imaging quality and especially in some pine position. And uh, here was, I would think, uh, I would give back to Francesco um, for the further discussion of the case. Thank you, Nina. So actually, uh, thank you for this uh, nice overview of the imaging uh, basis for discussion. and. I have the privilege to have uh, uh, Christophe Leclerc with us, uh, past president of the ERA, and this uh, is a great opportunity for uh, uh, us to have a discussion on these cases because I think in the last uh, uh, two, two, three years, uh, the PCR focus group have been uh, uh, discussing a lot of topics, and I can see that there is a growing awareness of this disease. So I would like to ask uh, uh, now, Christophe, after you have seen all this uh, discussion, what is your reaction from an electrophysiologist standpoint? Now, thank you very much, Francesco. I think that uh, I would say 10 years ago, we didn't care about the tricuspid valve because uh, there was no issue for us. But now with the uh, uh, advances, in, especially in imaging technique, we have more and more report for our colleagues, for echocardiography colleagues, that we have issue as illustrated in this case in a patient which is, lady is very symptomatic with a severe tricuspid regurgitation. So uh, we can try the uh, medical treatment, but usually it works more or less. And so I think that at this time we have to uh, have still, a, I would say, a nerd team between imaging interventionalists and electrophysiologists. But I would like to ask first to Tom de Potter, who is an electrophysiologist in, uh, in GAMP. In your daily practice, uh, Tom, do you have uh, many severe tricuspid regurg uh, regurgitation after implantation of pacemaker or ICD? Hello, <clears throat> hello, Christophe. Hello, everybody. Also, on my behalf, uh, thank you very much for the kind invitation. So uh, the question you ask is a very tricky one uh, already because a lot of it depends on how you define regurgitation and of course on whether the regurgitation is associated with a lead or caused by the lead. And I think as we heard in the presentations, I 100% agree, imaging is crucial. We heard um, good um, tips and, and points to look for when to identify that the lead is causing the regurgitation. I think um, in our experience, um, we found that TE and specifically 3D e uh, echo was very instrumental in helping us see deformation of the leaflet caused by the lead. If you see that, I think you can be quite certain that the lead is causing the regurgitation. Um, and um, on, uh, coming back to your question about incidents, um, I think uh, the numbers we saw from Nina are um, appropriate. Um, in literature, you find similar numbers. There's a very large Australian registry just published citing a 20% uh, severe tricuspid regurgitation associated with leads. 
but there's many open questions uh, like we heard apical leads uh, I, I don't have any numbers on his bundle pacemaker leads lbb leads all that is much too new and uh, i certainly don't have data of course on whether we can impact this at the time of implantation Thank you very much, Tom. Uh, now a question to uh, Edouard Marijan, who is an electrophysiologist from Paris. So, what are your advice to prevent tricuspid tricus regurgitation when you have to implant or lead in the right ventricle? Uh, thank you, Christophe. Thank you for the invitation to be here. I think it's a good opportunity to, to merge the two community because I was thinking about the, I think the EP community is just starting to be aware of tricuspid valve and tricuspid issue with the pacing system. And uh, uh, we are keeping an eye on the tricuspid valve, but probably most in the big centers with, you know, specific valve program. Otherwise, I'm not sure that, okay, we are. I'm, I'm not, uh, so the mechanism of the tricuspid regurgitation um, with a lead, a pacing lead, is very, very difficult to assess. You have, you know, indirect effect of dyssynchrony, but you have, of course, direct effect, uh, direct effect li uh, linked to the way of implanting the device on the lead. Uh, Nina was talking about the apical, uh, uh, the apical uh, lead versus uh, septal lead, but you know the, the 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 publication on this point is very controversial, and you have you have no big difference between both. Um, so I mean that because the mechanisms are mostly very difficult to assess, the prevention is going to be difficult also to address because we don't know which is the key, the key factor to avoid, uh, to avoid uh, a, a, a tracheospid regurgitation uh, following uh, pacing implantation. So this is, uh, so of course, the future with the leadless pacing is probably interesting. The pacing, also the his bundle pacing, but you know that, okay. And, and the pacing through the coronary sinus can, can be helpful to avoid any issue with the tricuspid valve. But uh, um, so I read a, a recent paper report from a Munich team uh, that uh, they, they were doing TEE during pacing implantation. So it's a great idea. So the paper is a good paper showing that it's feasible. But as you can understand, it's very time consuming and you need an echo guy, you need the anesthesiologist. So it's making things very difficult to just a simple pacemaker. So I, I cannot uh, answer very easily to the question of how to prevent. So, so far, we, it's difficult for us to, to prevent the, the TR, so we have uh, probably to follow. I agree with you that to perform a TEE would be great, but uh, in daily practice, it's not possible uh, to, uh, to perform a TEE. I'm not sure that Nina will have time uh, to assess the tricuspid speed uh, for all the patients implanted in, the, in her center. Uh, I have a question for Nina now, because uh, from, uh, from your point, uh, Nina, what are your advice you can give to the electrophysiologist to follow the patient after pacemaker or ICD lead implantation? I mean, uh, I really like the discussion about TE, but maybe it hasn't to be a TE during the implantation, so maybe it would be just enough to look uh, with a transthoracic echo if there is an increase in tricuspid regurgitation. But even if it's not, I mean, the problem we are facing is more um, a follow-up problem in the long term. So I think the main issue is um, that we keep in mind that the leads are increasing tricuspid regurgitation and that the people who are doing the follow-up, and it should be done with echo, let's say there is no consensus on when, but um, definitely there should be a follow-up up and uh, we should keep in mind uh, that we really have to look at the tricuspid regurgitation if there is any increase uh, in the degree um, on the long term. And for a patient, we have already a uh, tricuspid regurgitation, I would say, uh, moderate. Do you uh, advise if the patient needs a pacemaker to perform the implantation using echo during the implantation? Um, to be honest, I don't, I don't do it <laughs> regularly. <laughs> 
but um, usually I see the patients afterwards. And um, if if I see the patient afterwards, yeah, I definitely address the issue of tricuspid regurgitation. And in many of the patients, I do uh, just a quick echo just to look for precardial effusion or something. And this is also, a, it's a very quick view um, just to have a look if there is a, a big amount of tricuspid regurgitation. And this is a 20-second thing. It doesn't take a long time. Okay, we have a very active chat, so Francesco. Uh, if, if this is interesting, because the, the, the chat has been already uh, uh, reacting to this mm. discussion, the question is again, do you echo the patient in the EP lab after the lead insertion? And, and it looks like, if I understand, it's not done almost anywhere. Uh, it is uh, unfortunately very impractical uh, for, for uh, to what I understand, you know, uh, pacemaker implantation is probably one of the most successful uh, uh, procedures in cardiology, saving lives in a very standardized and simple fashion and to uh, make it more complicated with, uh, with uh, transesophageal guidance would be also difficult. Also, my question would be, then if you do it uh, TE guided, what do, what, do, uh, what do you target? What is the target for this lead implantation? If I understand the lift anatomy and the, and the uh, subvalvular apparatus anatomy, you should try to get uh, as far as possible from the clinical structures. But as you, can, as you, as you know, tricuspid anatomy is very uh, variable. And therefore, also having a standardized approach to avoid uh, post-procedural TR could be very difficult. So I think it's an is a ongoing process. But it's very interesting because it's a totally new discussion based on this uh, uh, increased awareness. Uh, and from the EP perspective, also, I would say that more you have people in uh, the operating room for the pacemaker mm -hmm. implantation, more you increase the risk of infection. So that is something also we have to take into consideration for, for the future of patient. But uh, I agree with you so far, there is a, it's a fantastic uh, uh, topic for research, definitely, yes. So for, uh, for Andreas, uh, so you, your patient did have a very severe uh, tricuspid regurgitation. I, I just have a question about the medical treatment for your patient. Did this patient receive a huge uh, dose of diuretics or? Uh, yes, um, I don't know the dose correctly, but uh, the patient was on diuretics and <clears throat> suffering uh, significantly from the, um, uh, from the tricuspid regurg. I just uh, would like to add a comment on this very interesting topic and on preventing. So what, what we do in every case is that we really loop the lead um, through the tricuspid valve and not go through with a tip. Because uh, what we see when we, when we um, uh, repair this valve surgically is that they are often entangled um, with, the, with the cords. And this is almost impossible if you loop it through. I don't know if this is done in every center, but this is a good thing. We, we feel that we can prevent some of these interactions. Yeah, there is some paper in the literature that if you you avoid to have the looping uh, implantation, you probably will decrease a little bit the, the rate of uh, tricuspid regurgitation. It will be better to go straight away. But uh, so far, it's a, it's a retrospective series, and I think it's very difficult to, uh, to, to answer this question. Uh, there is no specific rules to avoid that. It's more or less uh, after the implantation, probably not in the acute phase, but probably several weeks or months after the implantation that we have to assess uh, the tricuspid. I have a question uh, uh, for Nina, because you said that you are following up these patients. Uh, uh, you, you see the patient before and after. And so what is your trigger? So if what, what you don't like, what happens if you see something which is wrong and when you start thinking you should do something else? Um, okay, that's a really good question. I mean, um, if I implant the pacemaker, I usually um, um, do the programming and everything right after. So I really have some time for the patient at this specific moment and I, just use a TTE probe to, to look at the tricuspid regurgitation. I wouldn't like to see a, a, a big increase in tricuspid regurgitation right after the implantation. 
So during follow-up, it's much more difficult because what to do? I mean, um, if you had a mild tracheostomy regurgitation before, and then you see a uh, mild to moderate, a little bit of increase, but you see a mild of moderate tracheostomy regurgitation, um, maybe three months after the procedure, would you really do anything? You, I don't think so. Nobody would would really reposition the lead or something. So it's just something we should uh, further follow up. So it's it's a difficult question how to really address it appropriately. Yeah, it's a very good point you mentioned, uh, Anina, because uh, for the electrophysiologist, it's very easy to remove a lid implanted a few weeks or a few months ago. It's uh, very easy. But on the other end, you have a, an increase in the risk of infection. So we have each time to have a balance between infection and uh, the repositioning of the lid. And we have to be sure that the lid is really uh, responsible for the tricuspid regurgitation. So it's something that we do sometimes. But it's a long discussion with the echocardiographist to convince us that the lead is really, really responsible for the tricuspid regurgitation. And Christophe, is there any guidelines in our guidelines? I mean, is there any mention about doing a systematic uh, echo after implant? No, absolutely not today. Uh, as you mentioned in the, uh, your introduction, I think it's something that the electrophysiologist uh, not discover, but realize, I would say. Mm. And so uh, I think that in the next uh, uh, pacing guidelines in 25 or 20, uh, 25, 26, it's something we have to implement, uh, at least to discuss, uh, even if we don't have a randomized control trial. But I think that the collaboration between a, uh, echocardiographists, a EP, and also interventionalists uh, should be emphasized uh, for the future guidelines, definitively. Yeah. So. Uh, we didn't discuss uh, uh, enough the issue of lead extraction. So lead extraction may be associated with, uh, with issues. Uh, in some cases, we try to, uh, we, we think about uh, removing leads because they may generate TR, but in, in some cases, it could be even uh, a, uh, a, a reason for, to, uh, to uh, produce a lesion. So now, I'd like to ask uh, a question uh, to Eloi Marjon. The, uh, is there any role for lead management to treat TR? If we see these patients uh, coming with a, a lead-induced or lead-associated tricuspid regurg, how often you can uh, reduce it by uh, removing, repositioning, or whatever? So, yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Uh, if we first discuss the extraction, so, I mean, it's a specific intervention on the lead, the room uh, in which extent the extraction may improve uh, the tracheospital regurgitation, it's, it's a great question. In theory, we could say probably yes at one condition or maybe two conditions. The first condition would be that there is a causal relationship between the tracheospital regurgitation and the lead. And the second condition would be that because we know that the, the lead extraction may be a very aggressive and can damage uh, the, the tricuspid valve, actually. So this is the two issue. And to be honest, but we can, it's an open discussion, in the daily practice, uh, usually the mechanism of tricuspid regurgitation is not unique. And it's very rare when, when the regurgitation speed regurgitation is only related to the lead. So this is uh, uh, part of the response saying that, OK, the lead extraction may be helpful uh, to reduce uh, uh, tricuspid speed regurgitation, but uh, in, in the extent to which it's probably a small extent. And, and what is the ideal candidate? So if you think, uh, you know, there is the one that you really want to treat, uh, how you select this patient? Is by the time of implantation, by echo? What is uh, your guidance? So the first would be, again, the first would be the, the patient where the lead is causal in the, in the tricuspid regurgitation, for sure. And it would be a patient with a low risk of lead extraction. Um, and, uh, however, um, lead extraction has two goals, I would say. The goal of reducing the, the regurgitation, and we just discussed this point. And also, the second goal would be to facilitate 
the intervention on the tricuspid valve, either uh, 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 um, a prosthesis or uh, just a, a replacement or repair. So the, 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 the lead extraction can help to facilitate the intervention of the valve. However, it's not the only tool we have to facilitate the, the valve intervention. Now we can use, you know, some kind of, you know, uh, steerable catheter that can, you know, help us to put the lead in another direction during the interventional uh, um, uh, intervention of the valve. Yeah, using Agilis or yeah, exactly. Agilis or you know, EP catheter. Well, EP catheter. Ca actually, yeah, still yeah. Uh, EP catheters we are using to to uh, pull, pull, push on the on the side the the, the the leads because obviously if the uh, lead is involved in the tricuspid regurg, then uh, the the target of therapy corresponds to the lead, and then you can really go and have interactions, particularly with uh, edge to edge repair. So I have a curiosity. Uh, how many different uh, lead extraction devices and technologies are available, and what is the one that you prefer for uh, um, to specifically to protect the tricuspid? There is no, you know, direct comparison between the different tools we have. Um, so I, I would say that for the percutaneous approach, we have mostly, I would say, mainly four approaches. Uh, the simple, you know, simple traction or when we are using locking stylet that help to put the pressure distally on the lead. So it's good, I mean, for young leads. It's okay for young leads. We have mechanical extraction, uh, either telescopy or rotational, rotational uh, 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 that allow to disrupt all the, the material around the, the lead. The third one, uh, which is actually the most used is the laser, laser to use laser sheaths that uh, allow to dissolve uh, to dissolve the, the around the, the leads. And finally, we have the fourth uh, approach, which is a tr very traditional approach, but that can be very helpful. It's the femoral approach using snares. And this is uh, very interesting, you know, mostly when you are dealing with fragments of leads uh, that could, you can extract more easily. Thank you. There is one uh, question from, uh, from the uh, audience uh, about uh, AFib and uh, TR. And we will probably <laughs> have to organize a new session together, uh, Christophe, in the future, because I think it's a very emerging subject. Yeah, it's, it's a very interesting topic and uh, as you know, we, we are discussing now about atrial cardiomyopathy and I think that for the, all these patients, the, the role of electrophysiology could be very interesting. First, to understand the mechanism of this uh, uh, atrial cardiomyopathy, but also to propose some solution, especially, of course, with ablation of atrial tachycardia because we know that uh, in some patients, after ablation of uh, atrial tachycardia, we have a significant reduction in, uh, in tricuspid uh, regurgitation. But I think that could be uh, the topic of our next webinar because yeah. we have uh, many things to say about that. Absolutely. And so to, to go back in, in focus on, on our case, so uh, I remind everybody we're talking about a patient from Vienna, actually. Uh, she's a lady, uh, she's old, and she has a uh, tricus severe tricuspid regurgitation associated with, uh, uh, with a lead. And uh, I'd, like, I'd like to ask uh, Martin Andreas to uh, make us an overview of what are the uh, surgical and interventional uh, options that we can offer to this kind of patients. Thank you. So um, I will go uh, right into the topic and just uh, let you know that one um, one option, of course, is if you want to avoid um, if you want to avoid uh, action uh, interaction with the tricuspid valve, you may remove the lead, as we have heard before, and you can also use, tr for example, transapical uh, uh, trans um, thoracic leads, which can be placed epicardially, uh, minimal invasive. So that's one surgical technique which. Is, uh, which is used to, to avoid any interactions with the, with the tricuspid valve. And there are two different systems 
Uh, one is the screw-in device, and then there's another system called the RAM device, which can place uh, leads minimally invasive transepically. Um, importantly, I want to uh, go a little bit also into, um, into the analysis regarding pacemaker lead-associated tricuspid Regurg and what we what we saw from the patients from Vienna, as this was this our case is also one from Vienna, uh, that patients who have a previous tricuspid, uh, previous right ventricular dilation, do have a higher risk of um, of developing um, pacemaker lead associated um, tricuspid regurg. So there. To add to the discussion before, there may be uh, also patients who are at higher risk to develop this disease, and this has also an impact on survival um, of the patient. To uh, as a surgical option to treat patients with uh, lead-associated um, tricuspid uh, regurg, of course uh, there is uh, tricuspid um, repair and tricuspid replacement surgically. Um, and uh, as uh, we talk about lead association tricuspid regurg, these are typically um, isolated patients. And we have done a registry from 13 centers around uh, the globe where we included patients with isolated tricuspid surgical procedures. And we made a, an, we made a um, propensity match, matching comparing the uh, replacement and the repair. The overall survival after isolated tricuspid surgery is um, about uh, 70% uh, at seven years and 50% at uh, 10 years. Um, and what we know is that patients who have a um, replacement have a higher risk of mortality on the long run, maybe associated to a lot of different reasons, but typically these patients have, uh, have the highest risk for them is cardiac death. So there is something which is associated with the procedure itself. And what we also know from another study is that patients who have a, who have a decreased right ventricular function are at higher risk. There are four stages of right ventricular function. And you may see well at the couple of markers, those patients who were at stage four and had the worst right ventricular function were at the highest risk to die. So just keep in mind during your risk assessment that it's not without risk to do a surgery on patients with isolated tricuspid uh, regurgs. Um, I just want to come back for uh, to the typical surgical repair techniques for tricuspid uh, repair. So this is a, a tricuspid repair ring where the leaflets stay in place. And I, I want to point out that the uh, that the AV node is preserved as the ring is not complete. It's, it's an open ring. However, if the leaflet is diseased, this may not be the right procedure to, to choose. And if the lead is interacting or perforated the leaflet, it's very hard to repair the valve. And then we have to go for replacement. This is one of the valves which are able to uh, replace valve. They can be cinched down for the ease of implantation. And we use... Uh, biological valves in the tricuspid space. This is one image of a lead um, going through the tricuspid valve, and this lead can be kept in place uh, once a valve is in place. But uh, I uh, know from the discussions that this is a, a scenario which is not very highly appreciated by the EP community, and I agree that it's not a good idea also, even if there is, uh, because there are several other options normally to make a pacemaker. So once uh, you can place, uh, you can keep the lead in place, but probably most of the cases are taken out. Um, and this is also one image I like to show because if you, you can imagine, if you really go with the lead um, uh, while implantation directly into the ventricle without looping it, you may easily get entangled as you see in this image. And this is one technique where you can keep it in, but I would also rather like to uh, suggest to keep it out and make an epicardial lead. Just, uh, uh, just in addition, if you have a patient who is operable, we now have minimal invasive techniques to really have the patient spare sternotomy if an isolated placement is used. And just uh, also in addition, if the right ventricle is 
disease, and this is an upcoming field for surgery in the future. There are also subvalvular techniques to restore the late ventricle, but this is probably something to discuss. Most of the patients, however, do have a high surgical risk, and these patients should go for interventional treatment, and we have several devices in the pipeline and also in clinical use since years. One is the well-known mitra clip, which was, uh, which was also primarily off-label, but then on-label, can now be used as triclip to repair the tricuspid valve in addition to the mitral valve. Uh, as Nina already pointed out, the typical position is between septal and anterior, and then between septal and posterior leaflet. Um, and with the new clip generations, we do have an, uh, a higher success rate to really grasp the leaflets and get good results. Then there is the Pascal system. It's an it's a alternative uh, system to make a leaflet uh, adaption, a transcatheter edge-to-edge repair. And if there is an isolated annular dilatation, there is also the cardioband tricuspid, which may be used for patients with a wide gap. If those uh, methods are not sufficient, um, there are valves developed for transcatheter tricuspid valve replacement, but I have to admit that these are all early stages and centers are, uh, are often do not have access to these valves, especially in Europe, so it's more something for the future. And of course, if, if there is a tricuspid valve in place, you can always use a uh, uh, valve in valve implantation. This is a one case we had in Vienna without the pacemaker lead, where we used the the, um, the new clips, the new white clips to repair the tricuspid valve. And what you see is that the edge to edge repair of the tricuspid valve does not only uh, uh, repair the leaflets or bring the leaflets together, but has also an effect on annular dilatation, which is very important in the tricuspid valve. And if you have problems with images, which may something sometimes the case, you can also use eyes to improve the imaging of the leaflets, and uh, you can improve your grasping if you uh, if you want to have a good grasping. If everything is not going to work very well, then there is also the Trecento system. It's a stent between the superior and inferior carval vein, which then um, atrializes, uh, which then um, uh, prevents the backflow in the superior and inferior vein. The, the implantation is very easy. And this is also a patient with heavy history of pacemaker surgery. As you see, several uh, epicardial leads in this patient. And this patient had three operations previously, and the pacemaker uh, placed epicardially. And in this patient, there was no other option than to just implant the system. Uh, and you see the stent is developed very easily from the superior carval vein down to the inferior carval vein and uh, prevents the patient from having a, a backflow during uh, systole in the, in the liver and also in the ubera vein. The result was okay, but this is an experimental treatment so far. So in conclusion, surgery for tricuspid disease uh, may also rise due to the increased awareness also um, in the EP segment, but in general due to the increased uh, therapeutic options. Risk assessment should include novel scores, um, and the right ventricular function is key to really score the risk of the patient. And we do have now also minimal invasive techniques and subvalvular repair techniques to improve the outcome of surgery. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Uh, so I already react directly with one question coming from, uh, from our uh, participants. Uh, it's, it's a funny question because it says, what percentage of patients develop AFib after cardioband device placement? So for the, uh, you have been going very fast into the, into the parade of devices. Cardioband is an annuloplasty device. Uh, I don't think there is the answer to this question to, uh, to our friend uh, Jorge Eduardo Chavarriega Quiseno. Uh, also because mainly these patients they already come in AFib, so they, they, uh, almost uh, more than 75% of patients who are submitted to these procedures today have an associated permanent AFib. So 
calculating the risk of having a, in a field if you implant something in the annulus. But I'd like to ask this question now to the ethophysiologist. So what happens if we interact with the annulus? Do you expect any, uh, any uh, uh, electrical impact on, on this, from these uh, procedures? Personally, I don't think so for the electrical impact. I think it could be a good impact in terms of uh, reduction in the size of uh, the left atrium, so uh, the right atrium, so probably it will be helpful uh, perhaps to reduce the burden of atrial fibrillation, but uh, I don't have any data about that uh, because it's still an emerging technique, I would say, and so it's difficult. As you mentioned, all these patients have already a fib when they are referred for this technology. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, I, I just want to, uh, to, to ask a, a question for, uh, it's about, um, for the surgeon, especially for, for Martin, uh, about, uh, w I think that s some, f some surgeon, when they implant uh, a tricuspid valve, systematically they don't put epicardial lead for the future. Because sometimes I have to implant a uh, patient with a complete heavy block after a uh, uh, tricuspid valve replacement. Usually we try to go to the coronary sinus, which is uh, one solution to avoid to go through the veil, but sometimes it's difficult for any reason. So is it something you consider uh, to uh, avoid pacing through um, tricuspid valve um, replacement, Martin, when you make a I would say isolated uh, tricuspid replacement. Do you consider some sometimes to put definitely definitive epicardial leads and in case of? Is it something you do sometimes? So I would do this in case we have a bad left ventricular function and we expect the patient to maybe need resynchronization because then we really have a problem with a, a coronary sinus lead. Otherwise, we really often use coronary sinus leads to protect the uh, to protect uh, the tricuspid valve also after surgical repair or replacement. So this is a common practice, and I would agree with you that epicardial leads are not commonly used. But uh, we do use them if we are afraid to have a uh, to ha to to be in need of resynchronization therapy. Yeah, the the question is about durability. I've been uh, always informed by my EP colleagues that uh, they don't they don't like the durability of the epicardial leads. Is there enough? Uh, uh, research and development in this field, because actually this, your, your point is very well taken. Uh, if you look at the, uh, at the data, the risk of pacemaker after, uh, after uh, tricuspid, surgical tricuspid and interventional tricuspid implant is above 10 percent. So it is a high risk of uh, needing a pacemaker. Do you see any improvement in the epicardial leads in the future? Ah, there were some improvements many years ago because we went to the unipolar leads, to the bipolar leads, so, but it's uh, not a very huge market, so as you can imagine, the uh, development are not so important. But now I think th they are more reliable than they were 10 or 15 years ago. So, but we can have issues, especially in young patients, but uh, usually it, uh, I would say it works better than before. You know. I have a question to, to Eloi about what we call jailing leads because uh, electrophysiologists are sometimes a little bit afraid because interventional want to implant a, a stent with a valve inside and so the lead is trapped. So what do you think about that? Um, I, I would say that there is two risks uh, why we are not so comfortable with the uh, uh, J leads is that there is a in case of any infection, the extraction will will be will become very very difficult. Um, and the second issue is that um, it's about the lead integrity and uh, that can be compromised. Uh, and we don't know we don't know exactly the natural history of a lead, uh, such a lead uh, like this. So the, for sure, for, for patients who clearly has, has no uh, ventricular escape rhythm, it could be an issue to have, you know, a, 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 frail, a, lead, a frail lead, mm. as you said. Uh, probably in these patients, it could be very uh, useful to have a combined approach 
with extraction of the lead, implantation yeah. Yeah. of the lead in the coronary sinus, or and then after or. Or, yeah, yeah. or leadless pacemaker. Or leadless pacemaker. And then after, you have yeah. more flexibility for yeah. implanting your valve. And this is also, uh, this is a very important uh, discussion. Uh, I want to react immediately because this is one of the new uh, hard teams. Uh, when you have this kind of problems, we need to interact, we need to have a plan how to manage these patients with uh, existing leads in case they have to undergo an intervention. And there are different interventions. Again, in surgery, sometimes we are probably, it's a bit easier to deal with these leads and we, you can try to position them with a small suture in the corner. Probably it's not having a huge impact in lead extraction possibility afterwards. But if you do percutaneous procedures, uh, actually imagine if you implant a tricuspid uh, prosthesis, now we can replace valves. We have seen a number of different prosthesis and have been done frequently an implant in, in patients with pre-existing leads and probably we should uh, become a bit more aware of the issue and, 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 and manage these patients differently. Yeah. I think uh, we are now at the time for uh, uh, understanding what has been done in your case, Martin. So probably you should present uh, 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 your case. How did you treat it? Thank you. So uh, maybe we can go to the slides. So uh, we, we decided to go for an interventional treatment in these patients as we uh, had a high risk also in the tree score. And um, uh, we had uh, also uh, the um, higher age and uh, the ulcus, which is uh, open wound, which is not going into the scores, but it's not good for uh, a surgical procedure. So uh, we, got, we went for triclip with the triclip system. And we place the first clip between the septal and the anterior leaflet next to the lead. And what you see is that the lead is not moving at all. So it seems to be fixed at the leaflet as we expected before, but the grasping uh, of the first clip uh, was fine. And then we placed a second uh, clip at the posterior leaflet. And it's, it's easy to see here on the, um, on the fluoros fluoroscopy that the lead is still between the two clips uh, on the septal uh, leaflet and in the end um, let's see if the video runs we had a, a mild tricuspid regurge uh, we had two clips placed it's hard to see as the clips make some shadowing but you see that you have two clips and the lead in between um, and there was an uneventful postoperative course. So this was a kind of a nice case as the lead was in the middle of the septal leaflet. It was technically feasible to, yeah, let's say, chail the, the leaflet, but get a good result for the tri um, uh, for the um, for the triclip. So, uh, so the conclusion would be that it's quite a frequent disease. Uh, and the interventional uh, management with tear is possible. Uh, it's, the, we, it's a sandwich technique. You can take it sandwich technique, clip, lead, clip. Uh, but if the lead is not fixed, this was not the case. In this, in this case, it would not be possible to push the, leaf, the lead somewhere. But in other cases where the lead is not fixed to the leaflet, you may move with your clip the leaflet, uh, uh, the lead somewhere, somehow away. And the requirements are always good imaging um, modalities to have really a clear understanding of the pathology as we have also heard from Nina. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Actually, I'd like to add on, on this uh, uh, conclusion that imaging is, these are difficult procedures. These are not procedures which can be done in every center. You need some exp expertise uh, around these patients, both in terms of multidisciplinary approach and in terms, as you mentioned, imaging is not, is not easy. Uh, you have to deal with the, uh, with the interaction with the leads. Uh, which is not only a mechanical interaction, it's also acoustic interaction. You have a lot of uh, shadowing from, uh, from, the, from these leads, multiple leads which are left behind. So again, I think uh, as we move forward, 
I look forward for a more uh, uh, active collaboration with you, uh, Christophe. I think uh, I'm very happy that we have been able to have this uh, webinar together, which uh, is really opening a new, a new channel uh, in between our professions. Yeah, definitely, yes. And I think it was a very example from, uh, uh, from Martin how to treat this patient who was uh, refractory to, to medical treatment. And I think that he, the lady was 81 years old, so I think the uh, uh, clip was, uh, for me, the, the best solution, and uh, uh, it works perfectly well. I think we have a very nice uh, uh, meeting today because, uh, as you mentioned, it's very important that we work all together. We have to learn from uh, each other. You have some technical issue. I, I had the chance in my life to perform during 20 years uh, angioplasty and coronarography, so I have the chance to see the, the both sides. But I think that if we work together, we will learn a lot. Uh, you mentioned the imaging, which is very, very important. But I think also that no every center can take care of these patients. To be very uh, efficient for this patient, you need to have a good team and also to have a volume of procedures because to assess the uh, cause or not of the lead for the tricuspid regurgitation, as, as Nina mentioned, how to treat the patients and how to manage also the possible complication during the procedure. So I think it's very, very important. So I think that uh, it's still a, a very uh, good example of collaboration between imaging uh, a physician, a surgeon, a interventionalist, and electrophysiologist. Uh, I think also that we have to keep in mind, because we discuss about the lead, but when you have tricuspid regurgitation after implantation of a pacemaker, you have to keep in mind also that dysynchrony may be also the cause of that. And it's not only because you have a lead there that the lead is responsible. So I think also is some, sometimes something we have to assess and the echocardiographists are, are very, very important. So I just want to, uh, to conclude. I think that in the future we will have more and more uh, uh, patients in common, which is very important. As you know, we have a significant increase in the number of implantation of pacemaker, of, um, of ICD, and so we will have more and more tricuspid regurgitation. The new technology, as mentioned by Eloi, like uh, uh, leadless pacemaker, could be very useful to avoid this uh, interaction between the lead and the tricuspid wave, but this has to be proven as well. And uh, I, I think that we, we will be, as you mentioned uh, previously, that we have also to make a, another webinar altogether about this uh, concept of uh, atrial cardiomyopathy. So it was, uh, for me, uh, a very good experience, and I want to thank uh, all the um, all the speakers, Nina, Tom, Martin, Eloi, my co-moderator, Francesco, and also the PCR group for uh, this very nice initiative. And from the ERAS perspective, it was, uh, it was very important for us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank and you. I remind that the uh, final uh, uh, webinar, which will happen uh, Thursday, 26th of January, uh, 2023, and this will be together with the ACVI, and will be focused on imaging, as we discussed today, an important topic. Uh, so we look forward to uh, meet you again, and uh, we already have a plan for next year to have a webinar on uh, heterogenic uh, tricuspid research. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well done. <coughs> yeah, well, one minute, I don't know, because two clocks. To be honest, we have uh, uh, the PCR focus group has been 